But anyway, welcome to your third module. We've got some of the staff basic here, and some of the staff over here, and some of the staff up over there. So we have a horse rider up there, and we have uh, the person who loves sailing, and also another horse rider over here. So we have all sorts of different people in the room. And I'm a camel rider, by the way. <laughs> Five days in the Thompson Desert in Australia, and it is absolutely the best way to see the desert. And I just love my boy. He was just the right here in Australia. So, we talked before about Mickey Mickey. We talked about um, your journey, your arrival. That was the module that you first started coming up with. And now you've come into your second semester, so you kind of got your feet under the table a wee bit. You know what things are about. So Mihi Mihi, just um, recapping on that, was journey, arrival, coming together, sharing your stories. Who are you? And how do you announce yourself? So I've just announced myself by the fact that I ride camels. Love camels, used to ride horses, prefer camels. Who do you belong to? Who's your tribe? Who are the people that you connect with? I study the Kabbalah. I've been studying the Kabbalah for 40 years. That's who I belong to, as well as other belongings. Where do you come from? What is your genealogy? What have you done? That's really important as well. What are your stories? Because it's everything that's part of you that you're going to bring to your whole design experience, <coughs> your practice, your learning, and it's who you are. How does being in this place, this feeling in this location, and acting in the world around you bring together with those around you? And sometimes the bringing together is full of conflict, and it's oppositional, and it can be hostile, and it can be tense. And that's what Ate is about. That's what we're talking about today. Then you moved on to Te Tauranga Waiwai, and guardianship, katiakitanga in your place, and I think it's significant now that uh, New Zealand is starting to think about its landscape and its waterways for future generations. It's how do you preserve the integrity, the authority, the aura, the mana, the status, the sort of genealogy of that mountain, of that waterway, of that forest, of those trees, of the long fit eels, of the creatures. That's significant. It's hugely important. Important. So before the third year students were talking about human centred design, for me human is beyond that, it encompasses all things. So if it's human centred, that's where you place yourself. So there's a bonding with place, respect and reciprocity embedded in historical and local landmarks. You might not agree with them, you might not agree with their principles or their actions or their values or the way that they're created, but you can respect what has been put into them. If you think about the whole business with Islam at the moment and the respect, I was sort of thinking it'd be quite interesting to go and embed yourself in there with those groups of people and think about how they think. And one of the ways that you learn about understanding respect for others is learning the language because the language is so significantly different. And um, we have a colleague here who's just come from Australia. And particularly Aboriginal tribes and their stories of tellings, that is really interesting. And their design work is incredibly important. And particularly when you come up into thinking about graphic representation and graphic stories. So what is the place that you have come to and how does it relate to your place? The place where you stand, your marae, your home. Where do you stand in relation to others, their belief systems, their worldviews, their values? What is your perspective relative to that? That is always going to be a changing thing. The more you reflect, the more you gather information, the more experiences you have, you will find yourself shift. And I teach 400 level students as well. And you will be a completely different person when you get to your 400 level study. So, now we're moving on to Atia. So, according to Atia, um, so according to Joseph, Marae is a complex of ceremonial buildings 
<laughs> They're a bastion of, it is a bastion of self-determination, a place to stand, Turanga Waiwai, which you've just experienced and gone through. And there's some beautiful work that's out on display. And like last year, I'm always impressed with the work that's come out from these modules, from your first year students. Lovely, lovely work, beautiful work, done with thought and respect. The Marae Atia is an indigenous institution that existed before <coughs> European arrival and is recognised throughout the Pacific Islands. It takes this form as a large open space in front of an ancestral home. There are very beautiful marae around Rotorua. I can't walk onto those spaces unless I'm invited. So the marae Atia, so there's the building itself, that's an ancestral figure, same as the space. It's like the space around you. You don't necessarily walk right up into somebody's space and go like that to them without being invited, excuse me, sorry. For <laughs> that was really good. And that's what can happen. And it can, I'll talk about that. It can be quite challenging. A marae provides connection between land and people. The Atia, the space of dynamic encounter. Thank you. You just had an example of dynamic encounter. When activated during encounters, the Atia renders relationships potentially tense and volatile and in need of sophisticated protocols to keep the danger of eruption at bay. The Atia thus constitutes a critical zone of interaction, strategically positioning hosts and guests so that their presence and transition has to be negotiated to establish protocols for the interface. So that's why you are led on, there's a karanga, and you are led on to the marae, and then the first thing that happens will be the wero, there's going to be the challenge. And this is what the art is about, you're learning in this particular module, is challenge. Challenge yourself, challenging others, and being challenged. And thus, it is related to the god of war. So this particular example, of the God of War, the deity, the Atua of War, is by Johnson Whitehealer. Johnson is a contemporary Māori artist. He has a significant profile. He originally trained in Whanganui, and then he did his doctorate with, Mas in, with Massey University. He is now profiled internationally, and he's really interested in looking at traditional Māori design and looking at the ideas of Western design and putting those together to create new forms. So he had a magnificent exhibition last year in the light boxes down in St. James. And he's very interested in typography, graphic design, product design, and also fashion design. Now he's a really interesting man to watch. This little seemingly simple thing, again, is a really powerful device because it is part of a series of building blocks, small little box, and he's also interested in looking at new ways to <coughs> educate, particularly in Māori, with Māori. And there was a fourth year student as well, and she's also looking at different <coughs> ways to talk about, to get te reo brought into the system again and support, to support those families and those societies. So it's a building block, and by doing that you learn to put together <coughs> your knowledge, your whakapapa, your genealogy through doing that. So he, if you're interested in looking at him, he's a really interesting guy to look at. does beautiful, beautiful work. So I've just gone through this, and then I'll go into the next space. And this, I've chosen this an example of uh, Dittmer's work as an illustrator, he was one of the illustrators of the mid-20th century who illustrated Māori myths and legends. So he's a Pākehā and he's a European, he's a German, coming in to illustrate somebody else's stories. But I particularly like this particular example of Tāne having to go up to the stars. So before you get to the Whāranui, it's going through the Ātia where you get challenged. Before you ascend into the meeting house before you ascend into the Whāranui itself. You go through the ancestor to receive, to be welcomed in to that particular group. And here, it's like you, you, there's a kind of, yeah, you are cha you're challenged 
and you have to kind of go through certain tests. So it's like anything else. It's like almost like an initiation going up through the steps. Particularly if you don't know the group of people or you don't know their, their conversation. So conversely, the domain of Rongo Matane, the Atua of peace, balance and cultivated foods, resides inside the Wharanui. It is a place where once the pūwhiri, and that's exactly what you're doing, you're going right through the pūwhiri pro process through art and design practice, has been concluded. Discussion, debate, deliberation, celebration and grief can freely occur in a peaceful, non-threatening manner, even though some heated debate and feisty dialogue can occur in the whānui, a good outcome is always aspired to. But one of the things I said to the first students Earlier in my career as an educator, much earlier, I was in education, I did some teaching in Wellington Prison at Mount Crawford, which thank God has been shut down, it's been closed, because it is an absolutely horrible place. I was a young woman, I had no induction whatsoever, I went up to the gates, and then the minute you walk up to the gate, you are met with a totally different encounter not friendly, absolutely impassive. The guards just stand there. There is no, nothing in the eyes, no warmth, no, hi, nice to see you, you've come to do this. And then you're taken through inside. And the difference between outside the building, which had the trees and the light and the birds, to walking inside to this prison, which had been designed in the early 20th century and it was way past its use by date. The first thing I noticed was the smell, the institutional smell of men who'd been locked up for quite a while. And then I was taken into the library. That's where I was teaching the boys, the men. And I didn't know them, they didn't know me. I had no idea where they'd come from, what they'd done, everything was completely confidential. And they had, um, they just come in. There were no guards, there was no security camera, and I was in that space. And I thought, I have to start talking to these people. One day, there were two librarians, and one of them said to me, Oh, your last name's Campbell, isn't it? And I said, Yes. They said, Oh, do you have a brother called Fraser? I said, Yes. Right. That was a those were my protectors, those were my connections, because my brother had a history, and it was history connected with those people who were inside. So that's the really interesting thing. It's like how you make connections with others in order to build a relationship of trust. Very difficult in a remand prison because the men are in and out. They don't stay for a long time, they're on their way to serve their time somewhere else. It was a really interesting experience but because it gave me the understanding that sometimes you are in situations where you have no education, no knowledge of the customs, no knowledge of behaviour, and you almost need a guide to take you through in there. So really interesting. So your peers are your guides here, they are your mentors as well and your staff are also your guides and your mentors to help you through this particular learning. So, so this is what I've just talked about. Going on to the right means entering into an encounter situation where challenges are met and issues are debated. All newcomers to the marae must be greeted formally by the tangata whenua. The prison guards invite, you know, are greeted by them. Not, uh, and it was certainly a formal greeting. Whether in the warmth of welcome, no, none of that. In the sadness of tummy no, none of that. Or in, or even verbal battle on mutual issues. So if you go onto the marae and you might be two iwi coming together or two institutions coming together, you know that you are there for a set period of time for a set discussion. The period of time might be flexible. Uh, it is a place where people formally come together on a specific occasion for a specific function. It has its procedure, which may vary from iwi to iwi, and it depends on that because of the genealogy of place, but also the dialects that are spoken as well through various associations. 
so another example, another illustration, I think, so the challenge to Tane was that Sun Gong <coughs> works to his own protocol, worked to his own time, rose up, and that's the challenge that came forth. So, the key elements are that it's a domain of space, so space is a key, key part of this. The cycle attribu attributes are orderly, orderliness, formalisation of movement and relationships, regulated behaviour, and personal boundaries. And I know in some of the papers that you are very much going to be challenged in terms of language. And that's important. If you don't challenge yourself and your views, how can you be a good designer? Particularly when you might end up working with somebody that you, you are a bit oppositional to. You still have to get alongside of them. So encounter is important. Interaction, traversal, because you're going across the space, and by going across that space, you transition from being a guest to being part of the family of the host. And then that's fully celebrated in the last module, which is Hakari. So now I'm just going to take you onto some slides where I think this has actually been mediated out. And they're just my selection of slides and they're from an entirely different kind of practice to you, a different way of thinking. But you might want to head down that space sometimes. So this one, I'm thinking of this one of like spaces and objects and modes of encounter and reciprocity. All events, despite the topic, share the intrinsic tension between the aims of the host and the experiences of the viewer, guest or participant, having an active role or not. So in this particular ins installation piece by a Japanese artist, I really like it because it's like there are no boundaries. You don't kind of know where you are. And I'll just relate another anecdote which made me feel, this is like a feeling I get from that. And that was leaving Tashkent, which is the capital of Uzbekistan, and not being allowed into the international airport. I was refused from entry, and refused entry by three uniformed guards with dark glasses on and Kalashnikov rifles. They didn't speak English, I didn't speak Russian. I thought, what do they want? And it left me feeling like this. Like I had, I thought, crikey. I'm not quite, it was just like weird, there were no boundaries. And then one of them put out his hand. And I thought, what is he wanting? And this is a country that works on, you know, you pay me money. A lot of corruption in that country. But I thought, I'll give him my airline ticket, and that's what he wanted, so that he could go and check that I was actually on a flight out of the country. And then finally, I just waited with these other two guards standing in front of me, with their, just standing with their rifles, just looking. And then he finally came back and gave me my ticket and I could go through. Really, really interesting experience. But it was like being in this space. It's like all sense of your boundaries, all knowledge of what is secure and safe goes. And that's part of the practice that you'll be in. This particular building, which I think is a really interesting one, and it's, again, I think of it as like a form of encounter and a form of transition. It's a vehicle for transition. And it's one that is not talked about particularly. And it's, a, it's, a, it's the Inner City Arts building for in Skid Row in LA. LA is normally known for Hollywood stars, etc., but not for this. So I just quote. So whenever opposites meet, I sense that somebody, something's moving. There's a, there's a tension. Even when there's no connection, even when there's no contact at all, something is being created that wasn't there before. And I think this is what this exemplifies for myself. Inner City Arts is a place for art and dreams, and it was built in the middle of one of the poorest and most extreme neighbourhoods in the United States. 10,000 people were living on the street, on the streets of Skid Row. Just think about that figure. So that's you, all living on the streets, plus modified, probably by 10, more. 
are not good at maths. <laughs> the district is home to one of the most stable populations of homeless people in the US. This place is rough, it's outspoken, a place that's all about survival. It is so contested, so intense, so unprotected, like a jungle. And right here in the centre of it, all there's a place of, of peace and tranquility, of beauty, protected from the outside world, almost hidden, end of quote. That's what it's like inside. Completely different. Completely different space. And all to do with the arrangement of space and the arrangement of things in that space, the colour that's used, the patterns, the textures, the arrangement, composition, light, all sorts of things that are fundamental to all design practice. Moving on, I love this one when we're talking about encounters, encountering of the different, of the completely different and unconventional with the norms of the past. The friendly alien, bridging the historic and the modern, time, exchange and metaphors replaces stasis. The amorphous form of the blue bubble is rooted in the architectural language of Archer Graham, which is a British architectural design company. And I love this because it's the fact is it's so different and it's so completely antithetical to the traditional upright and horizontal buildings, and yet it sits there quite happily, just occupying its own space. It's like it's a creature that's come from the depths of the sea, and you bring it up and you think, what is that thing? And it's come into our space, and then it inhabits it. Next one. And these are societies, <coughs> these are cultures that have centuries and centuries and centuries of kind of like a tradition in terms of their design, and then something that like this comes along, which in my view is quite Baroque. It's like the Baroque architectural forms. <coughs> I don't know, who's been to Spain? Who's had the job? Oh, <coughs> did you walk into some of the big cathedrals? No, some have. <laughs> are you aware of how elaborate they are, the Gothic cathedrals? Yes. And there's sort of, this is all part of it, it's part of the language, but it's done in a completely different way. So representatives of the city of Sevilla, in search of an identity-giving building gesture for both city and region, selected a daring construction that in its formal language combines forward-looking optimism with echoes of the local Gothic church building tradition. Despite great opposition during construction, shortly after, completed, after completion, the structure became a widely accepted meeting place for the city, and also during protests against economic structural reform in 2011, an emblem of civic and political consciousness. So it's different, and through that different, I can attract, it becomes a symbol, so it becomes invested with meaning, and that's what happens with design. And this is what it looks like from, from down below. It's very much sort of in the flavour of Gaudi's fabulous Cathedral of Barcelona as well. It's that kind of like extraordinary kind of flexibility of form inside it. Finally, I'm going to go on to Bruce Mount. And this is all dealing with challenges, discussions and encounters. So Bruce Mao says, what well he said in 2004, quote, I'm sick of modern design. I'm fed up with corporate cool. I can't stand interior design. I hate those designer guys. I love them, but I detest that fabricated artificial managed art directed look. I can't bear to see one more continuous surface. I've had it with perfection. I hate clean lines. No more computer-aided design. Down with advertising, down with PR, turn off TV, down with minimalism. We want maximalism, down with reduction. We want more, 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 more. Wealth, wealth is time, wealth is children, wealth is love, wealth is ideas, wealth is invention, exploration, wealth is box, wealth is collaboration, colleagues, friends working together. 
We're sick of the fake and phony. We want real. Forget bandwidth. We need. We don't need a getaway. We need a get to. Well, this is happening in Guam because the major cable to Guam for the internet has gone because an enormous <coughs> boulder fell on it. They are back to using gas machines. They are back to doing face-to-face -face meetings. Their tourists are going grumble, grumble. I can't connect with the Wi-Fi on the internet, so I have to go outside and do things. And this is what this is representative of. It's around a family table with a light and all the photographs of all of the people and all those sorts of connections. So you might find yourself in that position one day. Who knows? Um, I love this also when we're talking about difference in encounter. It's like your design can be quite playful. Some of your um, encounters, the installations you make can be quite playful things. You might use quite challenging words, but you can use them in a playful way. You can subvert what you think design is. And as students here, you have a great opportunity to do that. It's harder to do it when you have to work outside. <coughs> so I would challenge you to start pushing your boundaries of what you think design actually is. You've done some fabulous work up there. Finally, just these last two, because I, I love the playfulness, but it goes back to that thing of human-centeredness, connection with the world, connection with place, connection with your uh, with your whakapapa, but also your genealogy, which is almost going all the way back to Dittman's representations. So this is by a, a young Spanish artist designer called James Howell, who and his eclectic works and artistic illustrations transcend what is conventionally regarded as art and design. Now this is what I challenge to use to push the boundaries. Know your formal language first, that's important, and then you can turn on its head subvert and do things differently. This installation featured creatures that sign and defend the root of creation. And that's incredibly important to Māori. Really important. A bazaza, mean that means a mosaic tile, covered house with an army of toys living inside, supersonic pig seatings, I also love pigs, handmade wall graphics engulfed in a metamorphic, fragile, traditional ceramic forest. The installation was a vital <coughs> iconic manifesto, so it's a manifesto, again, that's another key word that you might well explore when you get to your 400 level study, um, about Hyon's personal cosmology, cosmogony that is devised of mature languages from heterogeneous worlds, his birthplace, Madrid, the Francophone culture from his childhood, and his skateboarding adolescence. Yeah, great park has now become a fantastic new space for skateboarding. <coughs> and finally, it is collaborative. It involves people working together. So somebody has an idea, they have a vision, and then they collect others to come into that, to make that happen. And again, there's a quiet space that has been transformed through <coughs> design practice. And it challenges the viewer, it challenges the viewer's expectations, just like you are going to be challenged. End of lecture, <coughs> end of talk. <coughs>